بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویلکم بیک ٹو دا کورس انٹروڈکشن ٹو کمپیوٹنگ آئی ہوپ مائی لاسٹ لیکچر ہیو بین ویری کلیئر ٹو یو اینڈ یو ول فائنڈ نو پرابلم ان انڈرسٹینڈنگ دی کانسیپٹ وچ آئی ہیو ڈسکسڈ ان دی لاسٹ لیکچر لیٹس فرسٹ آف آل ڈسکسڈ what what we have discussed in our last lecture in our last lecture we first of all discuss the parts of the computer system there were four parts of the computer system namely hardware software data and people the hardware consists of electronic devices the parts that you can physically touch The software consists of the programs that controls the instructions of the computer and performs the task given to the computer. Basically, it is the problem-solving approach. The data can be text, numbers, sound, and images that the computer manipulates. This data is normally provided by the people. who operates the computer they are called users next we have discussed information processing cycle of the computer systems it contains a four steps input processing output and storage the, in the input uh, the computer accepts data from some source such as the user or programs for the processing In the processing part of the cycle, the computer processing components performs actions on the data and makes some transformations according to the instructions from the user or from the given program. In the output part of the cycle, the computer may be required to display the results of its processing. For example, results may appear as text, as number, as sound or as images the image the sounds can be given from the speaker and the results can also be displayed on the monitors if the require if the results are required to be in the hard form the printer will be used the fourth step of the cycle is the storage this is an optional step the computer in this step permanently stores the information of the processing either on the disk or some other kind of storage medium such as compact disk dvd or blu-ray disk after that we delve into the details of computer hardware in this context we discussed about the working of the processor which is divided between the processor and the memory The processor or the CPU carries out the instructions from the user and software. There are two types of memory. One is random access memory and the other is read only memory. The random access memory holds data and programs temporarily as the CPU works with them. In the read only memory is the uh, permanent type of memory which helps the computer in starting up. and stores information about its hardware the motherboard is where all the devices are connected with each other then we discuss about some of the input devices and the role of input devices is to accept instructions and data from the user or from another computer then we discuss some output devices which presents the process data to the user or to another computer in this context there are some communication devices which perform both the input and output functions allowing the computer to share information then we delve into the details of some storage devices the two common storage type of devices one is the magnetic storage devices and the other is optical storage devices in the magnetic storage devices we discuss about the floppy disks and hard disk whereas in the case of optical storage devices we discuss about the cd rom dvd rom 
and Blu-ray discs. Then comes the most important part of the computer which is the computer software. There are two primary categories. One is the system software and the other is the application software. The system software tells the computer how to interact with the user and how to use the hardware devices attached to the computer. Operating system is an example of a system software. The application software tells the computer how to accomplish tasks the user actually requires. In a computer, data consists of small pieces of information that by themselves may not make sense to a person. The computer manipulates the data into information. Program instructions are different from data. In fact, they are used only by the computer and not by the people. Then we discuss about the various computer users. A user is an essential part of a complete personal computer system. Generally, the user must perform a wide range of tasks such as setting up the computer, installing software, managing files, and other operations that the computer cannot do by itself. There are some userless computers which are designed to function independently without a user. But these systems are not personal computers. They are called embedded systems. So this is a brief summary of the lecture number three. I hope you haven't find any difficulty in understanding the concepts. If you have any problem, you can always contact me by email. Let's start the today's lecture. We will, today we will discuss about the input devices. If you think of the CPU as a computer brains, then you might think of the input devices as its sensory organs. Means the eyes, the ears, and the fingers. Like the human, all our processing is done in our brain, but we take input to our brain through our eyes, through our ears, through our fingers, through our sense of smell, and our sense of touch and taste. From the user point of view, the input devices are as important as the CPU. Perhaps even more important. After you buy and set up a computer, you may take the CPU for granted because you interact directly with input devices and only indirectly with the CPU. But your ability to use input devices is critical to your overall success with the whole system. An input device enables the user to inform enter information and commands into the computer. There are two common input devices. One is the keyboard and the other is the mouse. There are various other input devices which can be used to enter data and instructions. The most common are the the keyboard and the mouse. But there are other devices such as the scanner, you see the microphone, the PC video camera or we call it a webcam. We can give input from a digital camera, from a digital scanner, from a card reader, even from a USB flash drive. You can give also input from another system using modem. The two most commonly used input devices we will discuss today are the keyboard and the mouse. If you buy a new personal computer today, it will include a keyboard and a mouse unless you specify otherwise. Other types of input devices are also available as well, such as variations of the mouse and special, specialized alternative input devices such as microphones and scanners. In our today's lecture, we will introduce about the keyboard and the mouse. 
today's lecture you will learn about the importance of these devices the way the computer accepts input from these devices and many tasks that enable you to perform your work on your personal computer one of the first peripherals to be used with the computers is the keyboard it is the most common input device for inputting text and numbers and it is still the primary input device for entering the text and numbers a standard keyboard includes about 100 keys and each key sends a different signal to the central processing unit if you have not used a key computer keyboard or a typewriter you will learn it very quickly that you can use a computer much more effectively if you know how to type so to increase your input speed you, you must learn to type quickly the, the skill of typing or keyboarding is the ability to enter text and numbers with skill and accuracy certainly you can use a computer without having a good typing skill it will take a little bit long time in entry but you will able to enter the system the uh, data into the computer but it will be good if your typing speed is fast and you can perform the work quickly some people claim that the computer when computers can interpret handwriting and speech with hundred percent accuracy then typing will become unnecessary but for now and for the foreseeable future the keyboarding remains the most common way to enter text and other data into a computer the keyboard comes in various styles the various model differs in the size shape and feel except for a few special purpose keys most keyboards are laid out almost identically in the figure you will see the IBM enhanced keyboard with 101 keys and these keys are mostly arranged in five groups in the top line you will see the function keys this is the enter key which helps you in entering the command then this is the number keys some special character keys and this is the English alphabet this is the tab key we have the control alt key shift key and these are similar as for the typewriter keyboard these are the cursor movement keys these are also text editings and movement cursor movement keys we have some special keys like print screen scroll lock and this is the numeric keypad from using this the numbers can be entered quite quickly The, key, the key, uh, keys on the keyboard is arranged into five groups, namely the alphanumeric keys, modifier keys, numeric keypad, function keys, and cursor movement keys. Let's discuss in detail these five groups of keys. First of all, let's see these the, in the pink color at the top these are the function keys and this is in the light green color light blue color you will see the typewriter keys at the top left is the escape key this in the orange is the shift key the big one is the space bar then we have the purple one the control keys the yellow one at the two ends are the alt keys these two are window keys this one are the cursor keys the enter key is the most important these are the extra keys for movement and this is the numeric key pad I hope you will remember this layout the alphanumeric keys is basically consists of the area of computer that looks like a typewriter it is sometimes called QWERTY why it is QWERTY? Because the first six letters on the top line of these are the QWERTY. And this is 
the pattern held by the first earlier typewriters developed in 1878. All, along with that keys that, they produ that produced letters and numbers, the alpha numeric group have some four speci specific keys. One is called the tab, the caps lock, the backspace key, and the enter key. Now let's discuss the specific functions of these four keys. The tab key is right here above the caps lock and besides on the left hand side of the Q key. The tab key moves you to predefined tab stops in, ma in many application programs such as word processor and text editor. By pressing the tab, the cursor is moved to a already predefined fixed number of spaces. This is the backspace key. It's normally in the type dormant, uh, in the top line and at the rightmost corner. The backspace key erases the characters you have just typed. For example, in a word processing program, you can press backspace or back over and incorrect characters and delete it. By pressing the backspace key, the cursor, uh, the a character which is just before the cursor will be deleted. The third one is the caps lock. The caps lock key is here and this key lets you lock the alphabet keys so that they produce only capital letters. And in the top line you will see that if you want to input the special characters such as this is the tilde, a mark of exclamation, at the rate of, hash, dollar sign, percentage, this is called caret, this is the ampersand sign, this is steric, this is the left parenthesis, this is the right parenthesis, this is the underscore and this is the positive or the plus sign. Here these are the curly braces, these are the colon, inverted commas, less than, greater than, question mark. By pressing the shift key we will use the uppercase the next group is, are the modifier keys the shift alt and the control key they are called the modifier keys why because they modify the input of other keys for example in other words, if you hold down a modifier key while pressing another key, then you are changing the second key's input in some way. For example, if you press the J key, you will input a small letter J. But if you hold down the shift key while pressing the J key, your input will be a capital J. In the case of caps lock, this will be in the first attempt it will print the input will be the capital letters while holding shift if you press the J again then in that case it will input a small J so normally if the caps lock is off the small alphabets will be entered while pressing the key and if you want in that situation if you want to enter a capital letter you have to hold down the shift key. When the shift key is pressed, it forces the computer to output a capital letter or symbol. Shift is also a modifier key in some programs. For example, you can press shift along with cursor movement keys to select the text for editing. The other one is the control key. The control key produces different results depending on the program you are using. In many Windows based program, control key combinations provide shortcuts for menu commands. For example, the combination of control and plus A will open a new file. Control plus C is used for copying. Control plus V will be for 
pasting. Control P is normally for printing. Control N is for opening a new document. And similarly, some other keys are also defined. The third modifier key is the Alt key. The alternate key operates like the control key, but produces a different set of results. In Windows program, Alt key combinations enable you to navigate menus and dialog boxes without using the mouse. The third group is, are the numeric keys. So these are the 10 numeric keys along with the standard keys. It is usually located on the right side of the keyboard. It has 10 digits and some mathematical operators like plus, minus, steric for multiplication and slash for division. It also features a numlock key, which is this one, the numlock key. When the numlock key is on, it forces the numeric keys to input numbers. If the numlock key is off, then you can perform with these function buttons, you can perform movement control and other functions such as page up, page down, home and insert and delete. The fourth group are the function keys. They are labeled F1, F2, up to normally F12. And this resides in the first row along the top of the keyboard. They allow you to input commands without typing long strings of characters or navigating menus or dialog boxes. The each function key's purpose depends on the program that you are using. For example, in most programs, F1 is the help key. When you press, it is a special window appears to display information about the program you are using. Most IBM compatible keyboards have 12 function keys. Many programs, they use function keys along with the modifier keys to give the function keys more capabilities. The next group of keys are the cursor movement keys. Most standard keyboards also include a set of cursor movement keys, which let you move around the screen without using a mouse. In many programs and operating systems, a mark on the screen indicates where the character you type will be entered. This mark is called the cursor or the insertion point. As you will see, this is kind of a, this is cursor. This mark called the cursor or the insertion point appears on the screen as a blinking vertical line. A small box or some other symbol to show your place in the document or command line. There are uh, four. There are four arrow keys, and there are four. One is home and page up and page down. These are used for the cursor movement. The arrow keys up, down, left, and right. They move the insertion point up or down a single line, or left or right one place space. The home and end key, depending on the program, you may be able to press home to move the cursor to the beginning of a line and press the end key to move to the end of a line. The page up and page down keys let you flip through a document, screen by screen, like turning the pages of a book. Press page up to jump to the previous screen and press page down to jump to the next. With the modifier key like control page up or control page down, you can straight away go to the top of the document or to the, with control, control plus page down, you can go straight away to the end of the document. Then there are some special purpose keys. All IBM compatible keyboards, they feature six special purpose 
keys and each of which performs a unique function. They are the escape key, insert, delete, print screen, scroll lock, pause. Let's discuss these six special keys one by one. The escape functions depend on the program or the operating environment. Typically, the escape key is used to back up one level in a multi-level environment. The insert key batches some programs from insert mode in which text is inserted into the document at the cursor to the type over mode in which new text is typed over the existing text while deleting the existing text and vice versa. The delete key removes one character at a time at the cursor's location. Delete erases characters to the right of the cursor and the backspace erases the character to the left of the cursor. The print screen allows the user to capture whatever is shown on the screen as an image. But this does not work with all the programs. The next one is the scroll lock key. In some programs, the scroll lock causes the cursor to remain stationary on the screen and the document's contents move around it. This key does not function in all the programs. The pause key. In some programs, the pause key can be used to stop a command in progress. Since 1996, nearly all IBM compatible keyboards have included two additional special purpose keys designed to work with the Microsoft Windows operating system. They are called Start and Shortcut. The Start key which features the Windows logo and is sometimes called the Windows logo key opens the Windows Start menu on most computers. Pressing this key is the same as clicking the Start button on the Windows task bar. The Shortcut key which features an image of a menu opens an on-screen shortcut menu in Windows-based application programs. Let's see this figure again as we have discussed all these keys and the group of keys one by one. These are the alphanumeric keys used to input numbers and alphabets. This is the escape key. These are the function keys. This is the space bar. These are the Alt, Control, and the Shift key. This, these are the Windows Start key. They, they write twice, one on the left and one on the right. And this is the shortcut menu. These are the four cursor, up, down, left, right. This is the Home, and Page Up, Page Down, Insert, and Delete. Extra keys such as uh, print screen, scroll lock, pause. And this light shows that whether the num lock is pressed or not, the cap lock is on or not, the scroll lock is on or not. And this is the numeric keypad. And this is the play key is here. And this is the enter key, which gives actually the command to the operating system. I hope the parts of the keyboard are clear to you and the functions of the keys given on this keyboard is also clear to you. One of the latest trends in, in, is the addition of internet and multimedia control. Microsoft internet keyboard and multimedia keyboard for example feature buttons that you can program to perform any number of tasks. For example, you can use the buttons to launch a web browser, check email, and start your most frequently used programs. The multimedia button lets you control the computer CD-ROM or DVD drive and adjust the speaker volume. Many keyboard makes offers such fe features on their newer models. So this is the top are the internet 
and the multimedia buttons which are shown here now let's see how keyboard works and it interacts with the CPU you might think that keyboard simply sends the letter of a pressed key to the computer after all that is what appears to happen but actually the process of accepting input from the keyboard is more complex when you press a key a tiny chip called the keyboard controller it notes that the key has been pressed it detects the keyboard controller places a code into the plan of its memory called the keyboard buffer to indicate which key was pressed a buffer is basically a temporary location with that holds data until it can be processed and in this buffer the code which is represented by the key pressed is stored the keyboard controller send, then sends a signal to the system software normally the operating system via an interrupt call and basically it notifies that something has happened at the keyboard when the system software receives the interrupt the operating system responds the interrupt by reading the code from the buffer and the system software then passes this code to the central processing unit means the processor for further processing the keyboard buffer can store many keystrokes at one time this capability is necessary because sometimes elapses between the pressing of a key and the computer's reading of that key from the keyboard buffer with the strokes stored in the buffer the program can react to them when it is convenient of course this all happens very quickly unless the computer is very busy handling multiple tasks you notice no delay between pressing the key and seeing the letter on your screen in some computers the keyboard controller handles input from the computer's keyboard and mouse and store the settings for both devices one keyboard setting the repeat rate determines how long you must hold down an alphanumeric key before the keyboard will repeat the character and how rapidly the character is retyped while you press the key you can always set the repeat rate to suit your typing speeds there are some other keyboards layout like for the people who type with one hand or a finger this is called a work keyboard the work prominence claim that the, the work layout uses less finger motion and increased typing rate and reduces error as compared to the standard qwerty keyboard this reduction in finger distance traveled was originally proposed to permit faster rates of typing and also in later year it was purported to reduce repetitive strain injuries although the work simplified boards has failed to displace the qwerty keyboard most major operating system such as microsoft windows mac os linux and bst unix allow one to switch to the work layout in addition to the standard keyboard layout but certainly the qwerty keyboard they it enjoys advantages over the work layout due to its position as the de facto standard keyboard keyboard shortcuts in most major operating system including windows are designed for qwerty users and can be awkward for work users such as control c control v games can prove nearly impossible to play with the default keyboard mapping especially those which use w a s and d alphabets keys as the controls people who can touch type with a qwerty keyboard may be less productive with alternate layouts even if they are more optimal so no, still the qwerty is the most popular keyboard layout
So these are the work keyboard layouts. For the both hands, you will see that the keys, alphabet keys are different. Although the top level is C, but the alphabet and numeric keys, numeric keys are the same, the alphabet are different. And this is the Vora keyboard layout for the left hand users. You will see that here, Q, V, Y, U, R, S, O, whereas for the right hand, the Q, O, R, S, U, Y, P, the layout is different. And this is from the website which I have consulted for the Warwick keyboards. And the QWERTY keyboard is this, as you can see, Q, W, E, R, T, Y, U, I, O, and all that. This is based on the, the Latham Scholes 1878 QWERTY keyboard layout which they have patented. Now let's discuss some non-standard layout and special use keyboards. We will discuss four categories here. One is the corded keyboard. The other is the software or virtual keyboard, foldable keyboard, and projection as by lasers. While other keyboards generally associate one action with each key, the corded keyboards, they associate actions with the combinations of key presses. Since there are many combinations available, the corded keyboards can effectively produce more actions on board with fewer fingers. The court reporters, the stenotype machines, they use the corded keyboard to enable them to enter text much faster by typing a syllable with each stroke instead of one letter at a time. The fastest typist as of 2007 used a stenograph, a kind of corded keyboard used by most court reporters and closed caption reporters. Some key corded keyboards are also made for use in situations where fewer keys are preferable, such as on devices that can be used with only one hand and on small mobile devices that don't have room for larger keyboards. The corded keyboards are less desirable in many cases because it usually takes practice and memorization of the combinations to become proficient. In the figure you can see a portion of the corded keyboard where you can just press and it is linked with the other keyboard. The software or the virtual keyboard. It is a software component basically that allows the user to enter the characters. A virtual keyboard can usually be operated with multiple input devices which may include a touch screen, an actual keyboard and a computer mouse. The software keyboards or on-screen keyboards often take the form of computer programs that display an image of a keyboard on the screen. Another input device such as a mouse or a touch screen can be used to operate each virtual key to enter the text. The software keyboards have become very popular in touch screen enabled cellular phones due to the additional cost and space requirements of other types of hardware keyboards. Microsoft Windows, Mac OS and some other varieties of Linux include on-screen keyboards that can be controlled with the mouse. Foldable keyboards as you can see in the picture the keyboard can be easily foldable. They are also called the flexible keyboards and they are made up of soft plastic or silicon which can be rolled or folded on itself for travel purposes. When in use, these keyboards can perform on uneven surfaces and are more resistant to liquids than the standard keyboards. Some they can, these can also be connected to portable devices and smartphones. Some models can be fully immersed in water, making them popular in hospitals and laboratories as they can be disinfected very easily. The next special type of keyboard is the projection keyboard. It projects an image, usually with the laser, here in the picture you can see that this is the laser beam which is being projecting this keyboard on the table. 
the device then use the camera I think so in this picture this is the camera which is basically reading or infrared sensor to watch where the user fingers move and will count keys as being pressed when it sees the user finger touching the projected image the projection keyboards can simulate a full size keyboard from a very small projector because the keys are simply projected images they cannot be felt when pressed the user of the projected keyboards often experience increased discomfort in their fingertips because of the lack of give when typing because you just touch there is you are you're not feeling you're basically touching the desk a flat non reflective surface is also required for the keys to be projected onto most projection keyboards are made for use with the PDAs due to their small form factor. The wireless keyboards are nowadays very popular. Uh, they provide uh, uh, provides increased user freedom. A wireless keyboard often includes a required combination transmitter and receiver unit that attaches to the computer's keyboard port. The wireless aspect is achieved either by the radio frequency or by an infrared signals that sent and received from both the keyboard and the units attached to the computer. A wireless keyboard may use an industry standard RF called Bluetooth and with Bluetooth the trans transceivers may be built into the computer. However, a wireless keyboard needs batteries to work and may pose a security problem due to the risk of data EVS dropping by the hackers. Wireless solar keyboards charge their batteries from solar panels using sunlight or standard artificial lighting. This covers the, our discussion on the one input basic input device that is the keyboard. Let's now discuss the other most common input device that is the mouse. Every new PC includes a pointing device as a standard equipment and all modern computers they have a variant of a mouse. The full-size PCs usually include a mouse as the pointing device. A mouse is an input device that you can move around on a flat surface usually on a desk or keyboard tray and controls the pointer. It allows the user to select objects. The pointer is moved by the mouse movement. The pointer which is also called the mouse pointer is an on-screen object usually an arrow like in this case this is the the arrow represents the mouse pointer and that is used to select text you can access menus, you can interact with program files, or you can interact with the data that appears on the screen. There are two basic types of mouse. One is called the mechanical mouse and the other is the optical mouse. The man in the mechanical mouse, the rubber ball determines the direction and the speed and the ball often requires cleaning. In the optical mouse, the lights shown onto the mouse pad, reflection determines speed and direction and it requires little maintenance as compared to the mechanical mouse. We will now look into the details of these two mouse. So you will see in the figure, a mechanical mouse contains a small rubber ball that protrudes through a hole in the bottom this is the ball and it, you can see that uh, on the bottom side this will move around and this will with these gears and all that it sends the movement. The ball rolls inside the case when you move the mouse around on a flat surface. Inside the mouse 
the roller and the sensor send signals to the computer telling it the distance direction and speed of the ball's movement the computer uses this data to position the mouse pointer on the screen the optical mouse is given here the, we have the LED then there is a prism which reflects and this from the surface desktop surface the lenses and the CMOS photo center basically sense here the optical sensor is down here this is the back button this is the forward button and this is the wheel button available <laughs> and this you can see in an optical mouse this is basically the LED light sensing assembly this is a screw which is tightening the hole and this you can see the right mere rectangular groove the scroll wheel and sensing assembly the left and right sensing assembly the left male rectangular groove and these are the other parts the benefits of using the mouse there are, the mouse offers two main benefits first the mouse lets you position the cursor anywhere on the screen very quickly without using the cursor movement keys you simply move the pointer to the on-screen position you want and you just press the mouse button the cursor appear at that location the second is that instead of forcing you to type or issue commands from the keyboard the mouse and the mouse based operating system let you choose command from easy to use menus and dialog boxes. The result is a much more intuitive way to use computers. Instead of remembering the obscure command and their values and also the switches, user can figure out rather easily where command and options are located. Basically, the mouse releases the user from burdening the memory. In the command line operating system, most of the user in the beginning find quite difficult of remembering the exact syntax of the command and entering it correctly. In most of the time, they made errors and the system gives them error messages. This delays their working and the users get bored and they tend to use do not, uh, and they uh, think that they should not use this system again. Third, if that if you are using a drawing program, you can use the mouse to create graphics such as the lines, curves, and freehand shapes on the screen very easily. The mouse has helped establish the computer as a versatile tool for graphic designers, starting what has since become a revolution in the graphic design field. Now let's discuss about the interaction movements with a mouse. You can use a mouse to move the pointer to a location on a screen, a process called pointing, like what I'm doing here on the screen is the pointing. Everything you do with the mouse is accomplished by a combining pointing with these techniques like clicking, double clicking, dragging and the right clicking. Let's first of all discuss the pointing. Pointing means pushing the mouse ac across your desk. On the screen the pointer moves in relation to the mouse like what I'm doing here on the screen is basically pointing. You push the mouse forward and the pointer moves up. You push the mouse backward and it goes down. You push the mouse to the left and the pointer moves to the left. You push the uh, mouse to the right and you will see the pointer is going to the right. To point to an object or location on the screen, you simply use the mouse to place the pointer on top of the object or the location. Techniques such as clicking, double clicking and dragging are usually carried out with the left mouse button like this one. So this is the left mouse button and this is the right mouse button. And in between is the wheel. 
To click an item with the mouse, you move the pointer to the item on the screen. When the pointer touches the object, you quickly press and release the primary mouse button. The mouse button is pressed once. We call it clicking or single clicking. And this is the most important mouse action. To select any object on the screen such as a menu, command or button, you just click it. Double clicking an item means pointing the item with the mouse pointer and then pressing and releasing the mouse button twice in rapid succession. Double clicking is primarily used with desktop objects such as icons. For example, you can double click a program's icon to launch the program. Dragging is an, an item means positioning the mouse pointer over the item, pressing the primary mouse button and holding it down as you move the mouse. As you move the pointer, the item is dragged along with it across the screen. You can then drop the item in a new position on the screen. And this technique is also called drag and drop. Dragging is a very handy tool in a word processing program. For example, you can drag text from one location to another in a document. In a file management program, you can drag a document icon and drop it onto the printer's icon to print the document. Windows and many other programs, they support right clicking, which means pointing to an item on the screen and then pressing and releasing the right mouse button. The right mouse button usually open the shortcut menu that contains commands and options that pertains to the item to which you are pointing and the scroll wheel like this is the scroll wheel so i'm going to back and forth within the presentation and this is the by clicking the right mouse button you can see the uh, the shortcut menus comes up by pressing again, it goes off. The scroll wheel is a mouse has a small wheel nestled amongst its button. You can use the wheel for various purposes, one of which is scrolling to the long document. Not all applications and operating systems support the use of the wheel. Then now uh, discuss the mouse button configuration. The mouse usually sits on the right side of the keyboard for right-handed people and the user maneuvers the mouse with the right hand, like what I am doing here, I am maneuvering it with the right hand. You are pressing the left button with the right forefinger. For this reason, the left mouse button is sometimes called the primary mouse button. But if you are left-handed, you can configure the right mouse button as the primary button. This configuration lets you place the mouse to the left of the keyboard and control the mouse with your left hand and use your left forefinger for the most mouse actions. There are newer mouse which enable you to configure buttons to perform different tasks than clicking. You might configure a button to delete selected test, for example to open a program that lets search you the files and such uh, settings may limit the usefulness of the mouse but can be helpful if you need to perform a certain task many times. In multi mouse, in multi button mouse, one button must be designed as the primary button referred to as the mouse button. Some mice, some mouse they have more than two or three and some they have up to six buttons. The extra buttons are always configurable they can be configured by the operating system or by the supported system software provided by the mouse manufacturer. As for the keyboard, you can also have the cordless mouse. Like what I'm using here is the cordless mouse. It communicates with the receiver attached to the port of the system unit. It normally uses the infrared or radio frequency technology. Normally we are using the in, in our handheld devices and our laptops, we are using the uh, Bluetooth technology. Now let's discuss the variants of the mouse. 
The trackball is a pointing device that works like an upside down mouse. Here in the figure you can see the trackballs. You rest your index finger or thumb on an exposed ball, then place your other fingers on the buttons. To move the pointer around the screen, you will roll the ball with your finger or thumb, but you do not move the whole device. A trackball requires less space than a mouse. The hands rest on the ball and the user moves the ball. The user's little desk space, there are mostly two buttons and it can be configured for both left-handed and right-handed use. The trackpads, also called a touchpad, is a stationary pointing device like located here that many people find less tiring to use than a mouse or a trackball. It is basically a small plastic rectangle like this is the small plastic rectangle and these are the two buttons. The finger is moved across the pad and the pointer moves with the pointer with your finger. It is very popular on the laptop machines. The movement of a finger across a small touch sensitive surface is translated into pointer movement on the computer screen. The touch sent a sensitive surface may be only 1.5 to 2 inches square so a finger never has to move far. The trackpad size also make it suitable for the notebook computers. Like mouse, Trackpads usually are separate from the keyboard in desktop computers and are attached to the computer through a card. Some special keyboard features built in trackpads. This feature keeps the pad handy and frees the port that would otherwise be used by the trackpad. The trackpad includes two or three buttons that perform the same function as the mouse buttons. Some trackpads are also strike sensitive meaning that you can tap the pad with your fingertip instead of using it buttons. Wireless touch pads are also available as detached accessories. The track point, this is normally available on the IBM ThinkPad machines. Many portable computers are now features a small joystick, this one, this, this red joystick, positioned near the middle of the keyboard, typically between the G, H and the B. This joystick is controlled with either forefinger and it controls the movement of the pointer on the screen. Because users do not have to take their hands off the keyboard to use this device, they can save a great deal of time and effort. And there are these two buttons just below the spacebar and they perform the same function as the mouse buttons. This is the left one and the right one. This is normally for the clicking and this is for the shortcut. On the IBM ThinkPad li line of notebook computers, the pointing device is called the track point. Now let's discuss the summary of today's lecture. Today we have discussed about the standard, two standard input devices, the keyboard and the mouse. A standard computer keyboard has almost 100 or 101 keys. There are five uh, groups of the keys on the keyboards. Most keyboards, they follow a similar layout with their keys arranged in the five groups. These five groups are the alphanumeric keys, which are used to, uh, to produce numbers and letters. Then we have the numeric keypad, which is used for quick number entry. Then we have the function keys, labeling F1 to F12. They are basically used for input commands without typing long string of characters, or they are useful for navigating menus or the dialog boxes. Then we discuss about the modifier keys which modifies the input of the other keys. There are three modifier keys, the shift, the alt, control. Then we discuss the cursor movement keys, which lets you move around the screen without using a mouse. The four arrow keys, up, down, left, and right. Then we have the home key, the end key, the page up, and page down. 
and with with using with the modifier keys the, we can quickly browse through the document then we have some special purpose keys which performs a unique function such as escape key print screen scroll lock pause key and then now a days on most of the newer keyboards we will find the internet and multimedia keys and they can perform various functions then we discuss how the keyboard works when you press a key the keyboard controller places a code in the keyboard buffer to indicate that a key has been pressed the keyboard sends the computer a signal to the so system software which is normally the operating system which tells the cpu to accept the keystroke then we talk about the war keyboard which uses left finger motion increase type rates and reduce errors compared to the standard qwerty keyboard there are some we also discuss about some non standard layout and special use keyboards we discuss about the corded keyboards the software or the virtual keyboards the foldable keyboards the projection with the help of the laser the projection keyboards and the optical keyboards and we also discuss about the wireless keyboard then we discuss about the mouse the other most common standard input device is a pointing device that lets you control the position of a graphical pointer on the screen without using the keyboard using the mouse it involves five techniques the pointing the clicking the double clicking dragging and drop and the right clicking there are two we also discuss some variants of the mouse such as a trackball is like a mouse turned upside down it provides the functionality of a mouse but takes less space on the desktop a trackpad is a touch sensitive pad that provides the same functionality as a mouse to use a trackpad you glide your finger along its surface and many notebook computers provide a joystick like pointing device built into the keyboard between the g h and b keys and you control the pointer by moving the joystick on ibm systems this device is called track point generically it is called an integrated pointing device i hope that the today's lecture is clear to you if you have any problem you can always contact me for today's lecture i will i have taken help from these recommended websites mostly i was visiting the wikipedia i will strongly recommend you to visit these websites and some other websites and make your concepts more clear stay blessed inshallah we will meet in the next lecture allah hafiz assalamu alaikum